you know, we talked about the, the change, and I'm, I'm interested both to hear from the institutional level what you've seen the, the change, you know, particularly around entrepreneurship, because universities were not very entrepreneurial a, a short time ago. I mean, if you came and said, I wanted to study entrepreneurship, you know, they would have thought, what are you doing in a, uh, in a university? Um, PACE's program actually started back in 1979. It's, it's one of the earlier programs. Um, and, you know, from the 80s, you've seen this big boom in, in entrepreneurship at, at universities. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how it's been to, um, you know, on an institutional level, and then maybe we'll talk from the, the student perspective next, but on an institutional level, um, dealing with you know, chancellors and presidents and provosts and other schools on, um, you know, bringing the entrepreneurship message across campus. Well, I can, I can speak from the perspective of a, a small or relatively small private institution where they, there wasn't necessarily a focus on what do they do once they leave. And it was, uh, I think, really, a, a, something that I had to convince the school to do, which, which was to start to say, we're going to try to provide a place where people can take their ideas and do something with them without, uh, without it necessarily driving tuition back into the system. And so that, I think, was the difficulty for me, was to convince them that this was a critical part of the educational process and that much like the gym or the library, these were necessary resources that needed to surround our students and that we, we were making a commitment to educate these people and put them out in the world to have successful careers and that we needed to take that next step, that we needed to create models, role models, so that, and that's why I started the incubator on the Pratt campus originally, was for our students to start see other students starting businesses and go, wow, if Sam can do that, maybe I can do that. It was very uh, basic in that way. But the school didn't quite understand why it was important for a long time. So, you know, uh, Mount Sinai, I think, looked out and said, gee, if you look where our PhDs are going five years out, they're not all going to academic jobs. Actually, it turns out the alternative career path was actually the majority career path. More of them were going to non-academic jobs than academic <coughs> jobs. And if you look at the postdoc community, which is one of the largest uh, communities on campus, postdocs were very interested in potentially uh, pursuing other areas. And then when they looked at the opportunity to translate uh, that government-funded research into entrepreneurial opportunities, I think they came together and said, this needs to be part of our strategic plan. And so at least for Sinai, it started at the top. It started with the absolute senior leadership. And so when I showed up and said, gee, maybe we should have a new PhD program or maybe we should think about technology development differently around the faculty, it wasn't even a, a sale. It was absolutely this is what needs to happen. And, uh, you know, rarely in life does one, do one's expectations get exceeded, but my expectations for how nimble the, the school would be and how supportive the school would be have absolutely been exceeded. And so I'm not sure I've had the normal experience. It's, it's been so. kind of, it's been kind of, <laughs> it's been kind of easy. And, you know, within a very short period of time, we've generated a huge amount of activity. And actually, Nicole McKnight is here. Nicole is one of the first students in a class I taught last year on how to develop technology. We had 40 students, they formed 10 teams. At the end of it, we had 10 working prototypes of new technologies. I don't think that was something that, you know, a few years ago the school would have envisioned, but they're incredibly supportive of making that happen. You know, it's interesting, when you think about thriving, robust entrepreneurial ecosystems, uh, a university is always at the center of that. You know, it's, it's, it's Sil in, in Silicon Valley, you know, Silicon Valley uh, started and, and grew so quickly uh, because there was Stanford University and then there were early successes um, that came out of, of, of Silicon Valley. You know, the same thing up in, up in Cambridge. Uh, but when you think about New York, I mean, even though we're a city of, you know, finance and business and, and a city of commerce, um, we didn't really think about entrepreneurialism, you know, 15, 15 years ago. Um, and it's only, you know, sort of the, the late 90s when we had our first big, you know, internet uh, success story with with DoubleClick, um, and when you you know talk to the universities 13 years ago, entrepreneurialism was nowhere on the radar. You know today every university is thinking about it. Every, every you know they're combining assets. 
Uh, there's a, and, and there's a huge amount of stuff going on, and I think that just that just adds to it. And, and it's great to see, you know, we have so many assets in New York in that, you know, in some sense, from an entrepreneurial standpo standpoint, we were way behind, um, but, you know, we've caught up very quickly. You know, last year, uh, New York went to become the number two center uh, in terms of venture capital money, um, which just goes to show you that, that we're catching up, and it really is, um, you, you know, a, uh, as, as we said earlier, um, a combination of all the f of all the factors, but the university is playing a much bigger role. You know, I'll, I'll note. Um, so, from from my perspective, up in Columbia, having been there about eight years, so it's only covering the last eight years. But um, there's always been a lot of activity and support for entrepreneurship at Columbia, but it's been um, somewhat fragmented. I guess is the way to, to put it. There's been great uh, support for it. There's been classes taught all around the university on entrepreneurship. Um, but increasingly what you're seeing now, and there's, a, there's an initiative at Columbia uh, called Columbia Entrepreneurship, fairly appropriately, um, <laughs> to try and knit together all of these efforts to be more of a, uh, a sort of a seamless uh, web of opportunities. So what, what you'll have now, and, in, and we're even seeing this at the, at the researcher level. So when I joined, the, our office was helping seven or so startups a year emerge from the university based on patented technologies. And these days, it's up to 15 or 16 every year. So we've nearly doubled in seven years. And part of that is because there's been organic growth and entrepreneurship within each department. But a significant chunk of that is because we're seeing the engineers working with the, uh, the folks at the medical center. You're seeing people who, uh, you're seeing software designers working with surgeons. You're seeing folks from the journalism school partnering up with coders. Um, architects working with the advanced materials people to do new building designs. So you're seeing um, growth in startup opportunities coming from people working together. And I think what you're gonna see in the years ahead at Columbia, and it's very exciting, is that the institution's been hugely supportive at, at trying to create um, a, a more coherent uh, network around that so that people can find each other more easily and take advantage of all the opportunities. Uh, thank you, and it's, it's, um, it's great to hear that, that, that they are so supportive. There used to be an expression, how do you change the culture of a university? And the response was one funeral at a time. But I think that <laughs> universities are being much, much more nimble. And speak about the, the student, you know, we know the impact, like MIT, you know, which um, now we've surpassed uh, the Cam Boston Cambridge area in venture capital. But they did a study, the um, 25,800 current active companies founded by MIT alumni employ 3.3 million people and generate um, world sales of $2 trillion, which would be the equivalent of the 11th largest economy in the world. And when um, Mayor Bloomberg announced, you know, his plans to, or the plans to create, you know, the Cornell NYC Tech Campus on Roosevelt Island, he said, you'll, someone said, you'll never succeed because Boston is the educational capital of the country. And Bloomberg's response was, New York City has more undergraduate and graduate students than Boston has people. And <laughs> I thought that was good. And then, and with respect to not having the capital at first, I love he, he has an expression, talent attracts money better than money attracts talent. And I think with all the, the talent we've had coming here, you know, the, the money, you know, has, has certainly followed.